of course, when the British came here, they deeded the land. It didn't matter that the Indians were here. It didn't matter who was here. They deeded all the land they wanted to deed to whoever they wanted to deed it to. Well, this land here, somewhere between the in neighborhood of 3,000 to 30,000 acres, we're not certain exactly how much because so much of the Page family history was destroyed uh, during the occupation of the Civil War. And I'll get to that in a moment. But there was quite a bit of land here. The land was deeded to somebody named Mr. Menifee, but he never did anything with the land, and it came down into the hands of John Mann. Now, John Mann only had one daughter that survived adulthood, and that was Mary. Now, she married Matthew Page. Now, the Pages were originally in the Williamsburg Peninsula area, but with Mary having all this land and the Page Pages having a financial well-to-do, they decided to come over here and make their family start here. They wanted this to be their home. So they built their first home. We don't know if it was Rosewell also, but this is where Mary and Matthew started their life. Now they only had one child reach adulthood, and that was Man Page the first. So now you understand where that strange first name came from. It came from John Mann. So Man Page the first was born about 1690. Now in about 1705 or 6, he was going to be sent off to England as any good Brit would have done who had money. They were sent back to be educated in England. And he would be sent back and to be Oxford educated. But his father had already passed away before he left. His mother passed away while he was in England being educated. So you had a very young man come back, very wealthy, with no controls on what he did. Now, he married Judith Wormley, for his first wife. The Wormleys were very influential in the 17th century in Virginia. In fact, Ralph Wormley uh, was the equivalent of a governor under colonial rule in the 17th century. So the Pages and the Wormleys were equivalent families that way. They were first families of Virginia. Now she bore him two children and when she was expecting the third child she passed away. And so, from what little does remain, it said this gentleman was very brokenhearted and had mentioned that his wife had suffered her death with great grace and dignity. But with two small children in the colonial times, you did have to have a wife. So he married again. In fact, his second wife was also named Judah. So he must have really loved the first wife. But the second wife was named Judith Carter Page. Now, if you're wondering, she was related to Robert King Carter, the wealthiest man in Virginia in colonial times. Yes, that was his daughter. So, Man Page I really married up when he married her. <laughs> so, uh, he married her in about 1718. Now, their original home the, of his mother and father had been destroyed at some period of time, and we don't know how or what the, or what the means was. But they were not living on the land at that time. So he decided he would build a home better than the governor's palace in Grand Georgia. And that's what he set out to do. Now in 1725, he started this home, but he would not live to see it completed. But he started with the best that could be done. He brought brick masons over here from England in order to build this home. He used Portland stone for the keystones. Now there may be a one stone, at least on the right hand side over the big window on the right. I will walk around and show you that eventually. Now the keystones were Portland stone, as were the window sills, as were the fireplace caps. They were all Portland stone that was imported from England. Now the roof, which was built in colonial style, was flat a little bit, angled up, and then flat again on the top. We have some diagrams of that in the visitor center. And that was covered with sections of lead that weren't much bigger than a foot by about six or seven inches. They were numbered and they also came from England. But the brick that you see, as in most of the homes in Colonial Williamsburg, was done on site. In fact, they did in the 90s, uh, an archaeologist named Noel Hume made some soil samples here, took about seven samples throughout the area, 
and of course created bricks. Then he took some of the bricks that were here to test them with what he had created. The elements of making the bricks were exactly the same, but the quantity of the elements, how much was distributed, was different. Now, we don't know if that has to do with 300 years almost difference in time, weathering, and of course this had a fire. So, but the elements were exactly the same, and that's why they still conclude that the bricks came from in the general area here. Now, the name Rosewell, we don't quite know where it came from. The creek was named Rosewell before it was Carter Creek. Also, Rosewell surname in English means Ford the Rampart or Ford the Wall, and in German it means Horse Mighty. So the name probably came either from the name on the creek or if it came from in Europe, it came from the past. We don't know which way or which meaning it had, but you see a lot of Rose Wall over here. You saw Rose Gill over here. Uh, a lot of that name also, it could have just been because of the clay soil was so red. But we just really don't know that. However, the house was started in 1725. In 1730, Man Page passed away. But enough of the house was done that he was able to lie in state in the Great Hall this way. Now, it fell to his son, his son Man Page II, and his wife, Judith, to finish the home, which they did. But there was a break in between, and the brick masons from England had to have something to do. So it is said that they think they went up to the Lancaster area and built Christ Church because the style of the brickwork is very similar to here. In fact, what you will see, you will see along here, you will see what they call stretchers and headers. That is called Flemish Bond style. It was very popular in Europe. That meant you had the long part of the brick alternating with the short head of the brick for a design. And you will see that as you walk around the building. Now the foundations of this house are three and a half foot thick. And it took until 1737, 1738 to complete the home. Now some other things that you will see. We know that two dependencies existed out here. We had a kitchen and what in the 19th century they referred to as a laundry. They were the size of a regular Cape Cod house today. Also brick. We know that because one survived into the 19th century and there was a photo of it. Also, the insurance policies that we have copies of from 1802, 1815, 1806, talk about the house being insured for $9,000 and the two buildings being insured, the kitchen and the dwelling house for $600. The brick stable, which was quite large, for also $600 and the smokehouse for $100. Now, as I've lost my train of thought, <laughs> anyway, the house was finished by Man Page II, but he did not remain here all of his life. He too had two wives, and she was from further north. Now, she went, he went north, built a mansion called Mansfield, had two dependencies and a breezeway to each dependency, and that's where he finished out his life. But his oldest son, John Page, acquired Ma Rosewell because he was the son of the first wife. Now, John Page is very notable in Virginia history. He was three-time governor of Virginia, served in the General Assembly and in the, the Congress of the United States. And for the latter half of his life, he wasn't here either. But his claim to fame also was that he, while he was going to William & Mary College for his education, became best friends with Thomas Jefferson. Now the two men bonded because they were both very scientific people and they became best friends. Now instead of going all the way to Charlottesville to his family home of Shadwell, during the breaks at college, Jefferson would come here and stay at Rosewood. This may have been where he learned his love of opulence and wealth because Jefferson's home, Shadwell, was not a very opulent home and this house was richly endowed. It supposedly had walnut wainscoting all around the interior, carved pilasters, Corinthian capitals, egg and dart across the roof. You also had mahogany carved staircases, marble mantel fireplace coverings, marble black and white tile floor, which was the rage in 18th century Europe. 
So the house was very richly endowed. And in fact, when Shadwell burned at one point, Jefferson lived here at Rosewell for a while with his friend Page. Now, it was also known that Jefferson would go to the top of the roof. There were two cupolas originally on top of Roswell, and he would spend time in there, and he would do astronomical experiments. It was also a little rumored story that he would have the slaves bring up a large basin of creek water with fish in it, and that he would fish in the basin at the top of the roof, probably while doing his experiments. But anyway, it's also rumored that while he was living here, he worked on the first draft of the Declaration of Independence. So this house was very historical, and even the land was very historical here. But John Page, like I said, became very politically involved, and he left Rosewell as well. And he was living in Colonial Williamsburg with his second wife, 27 younger, years younger than he was, and they were living at the Wythe House in Colonial Williamsburg. So again, this poor home was, was in the hands of caretakers. And a few letters that Mr. Page wrote, John Page, sending to England for paint because the house, he said, was in constant need of repair. Now, one thing you want to know, what was this house doing here? This, this was a tobacco plantation. And in order to finish this house in the grand opulent style it was, Thousands of acres were sold in order for it to be finished, but it still was a tobacco plantation. And apparently they didn't have a lot of luck with it. There was a crash in the tobacco market in the 1720s and the 1760s. And if you did not rotate your crops accordingly, which we have learned in later years, then the ground did not yield for you as well as it would have if you had constantly taken care. So it seemed like the Page family though they loved this home, were constantly leaving it. But in uh, 1808, John Page passed away. <clears throat> His wife, 27 years younger, passed away in 1837. Now, at that time, with 20 children between two wives, I guess they couldn't decide who would get the house. But it was in terrible need of repair from what we understand a year or so later. So the house was sold out of the Page family after 100 years. It went into the hands of Thomas Booth. He bought it for a very low price because of the condition of the home. But the sad thing is he went into the home and ripped out all of the finery that I had discussed with you. All the wainscoting walls, all the marble mantel fireplace coverings, all the marble tile floors. The only thing that survived into the 19th century was the mahogany carved stairway, which was a grand stairway. Supposedly, eight people could stand astride it. So that remained in the home. Now, after 10 years, Mr. Booth sold the house to his cousins, the Catlets. They kept it till 1853, and then it was sold to Josiah Dean. Now, at some period of time, the top of the roof line was changed because in 1838, remember what I told you, part of the roof was flat and covered with sections of lead. In 1838, a gentleman from the Farmer's Digest came to see this house because it was so famous. And he said the house was in such terrible need of repair that he wished the federal government in 1838 would step in, buy the home, and save it for the public. The changes had not yet been made to the house. And when the gentleman walked in, he said the first floor ceiling was sagging. Remember the roof design, flat sections of roof. After 100 years, it was leaking pretty bad, apparently. <clears throat> Therefore, somebody changed the roof design. The upper level of brick was removed. <clears throat> the roof was made to be a pitched gabled roof like what you see in most homes today. The two